Hi everyone, welcome to another session of Galactic Fidelity webinar series. Uh, today we have uh, Stephen Gorkeli from the University of Central Lancashire with us and uh, who is going to lead the second session, uh, so to speak, of Victor's uh, previous talk uh, on galaxies. And at the end of the talk, uh, there was an IPython notebook which was shared with all of you. And uh, Victor is going to uh, sh uh, show us how to do the exercises which were given in that notebook. Over to you, Victor, thank you. It, it's actually over to Stephen. Uh, Stephen will, will show My apologies. Uh, it's over to Stephen, actually. <laughs> no problem, no problem at all. Cool. So I'm going to start sharing my screen. And hopefully you guys can see my notebook. Do we, do we want to quickly introduce Stephen? Introduce myself? <laughs> well, yes, yeah, Stephen is my PhD student, and he spends his a significant part of his, of his time analyzing simulations. So we thought he would be a, a perfect person for uh, showing you the answers to some of these questions. So uh, I'll hand over to Stephen. Thank you, Victor. Um, so yeah, like kind of it's, so this is my bread and butter day in the out. I kind of am handling uh, simulation files um, and doing some level of comparisons to the Milky Way, which what this uh, M-body model was kind of uh, run for. Uh, so I'm going to show you how I've approached the problems from kind of um, how I, uh, from my experience, um, and try to kind of uh, step through some of these examples, uh, showing you kind of under the hood, uh, stepping through some of the processes in a bit more detail than just using a library to, to brush over some of this stuff. I have used some extra ones than the original ones that were imported by Victor, uh, but they're fairly common uh, and they just help with some uh, lower level kind of iteration stuff that is a little bit boring. So I'm going to step through each of kind of the problems um, and show you kind of my results and how I approached it and how you can uh, approach the same things as if you've kind of uh, not attempted these examples yourselves, but then hopefully some of you have. And then once I've finished, I'll invite you guys to kind of share any difficulties or any uh, things you've noticed as I've uh, talked through these exercises that you might want to bring up and ask questions about. So I'm just going to jump straight in. So we had the basic imports of NumPy and Matplot, just allow us to produce some figures, some math functions and PyLab just to help some extra bits on Matplotlib. These are just some uh, plotting parameters that make the plots look a little prettier, just the labels and things like that. It was just to help me out so that when I show you a plot, the axis labels are big enough so you can see them and I'm not squinting and zooming in and things like that. But we don't need to really worry too much. There's nothing fancy going on here. Uh, just some, just some um, making the plots look pretty. So Victor introduced the notebook at the end of the last session. Um, so we had an original kind of uh, text file to begin with. We've imported it, saved us as a NumPy array and reloaded it. And we're gonna do some basic density plots. So we're plotting uh, a 2D histogram of the X and Y data, uh, where the colors, uh, the more yellow it is, the higher the density. So the galaxy has the highest density in the center and we get this disk, some level of starting to see spiral patterns. We look in the XZ and YZ planes in XZ um, at the moment, if we look in, sorry, in the XY plane, the bar, which is at the center of the galaxy, is lying along the x-axis. So we look in the xz plane, we see the x shape or the box peanut shape uh, that uh, some barred systems grow. Uh, so we can see it quite nicely and defined there. In the yz plane, we're looking at the bar end on. And because the x shape is the vertical uh, extension of the bar, we see at its end that we don't see an x shape, we see just more of a spheroidal distribution. Um, which is what we'd kind of expect. And this is uh, a problem sometimes that if we're looking at uh, galaxies in the universe, if we look at an edge on galaxy and we see um, just a central kind of spheroidal region, it's very difficult to determine whether uh, this galaxy is barred or we're just seeing, uh, we're just looking at the end of the bar um, or there may be no bar in the system at all. Uh, you, you can't always see that just from the density distribution or the light uh, from the galaxy. 
So we're going to look at um, this kind of uh, projection of the X shape as we start to rotate the galaxy about the Z axis. So just very simply defined a rotation matrix um, using NumPy. Uh, this is about the Z axis. So you give it the X, Y, Z values and then an angle. We're using radians. Uh, so I, I've written it so that you can just put a degrees angle in and then you convert it to radians. Uh, very simply, just do the dot product with this matrix to return a new X, Y, Z, but rotated by an angle. Um, so then very simple for loop. I'm doing uh, for angles within 0 to 360, uh, 19 different bins. Uh, it gives me um, rotations at 20 degrees. Um, I plotted the X, Y, and Y, Z. That might be incorrect. Apologies, that's X, Z. That's my labels axis. So I've made them big so you can see them and put the wrong label on. But this is the X, Z axis, apologies. So you can see the bar is along the X axis. We see a nice X shape as we start to rotate through. And we rotate through to where the bar is in line with the, um, the Y axis instead. You see the X shape has disappeared and it rotates all the way through a 360. Very simple for loop, just so you can um, look through all the different bar orientations. And that'll come, uh, become important a little later on. Next, we're gonna look at just the velocities, looking at uh, maps of average voltage velocity. So we're looking in the XY plane. So we're looking from the top down onto the XY plane. Um, I've done a very quick definition of uh, Vx, Vy, converted to uh, radial velocity uh, with respect to the galactic center um, and the tangential to velocity V phi, which is about the galactic center. So I'll just very quickly define those. We've got VR V phi. And then I've changed the um, binning routine that I've used. I've uh, imported a package SciPy. And from SciPy, you've got the stats um, functions. And within stats, it's got this nice function called bin statistic 2D. You give it the two dimensions, the X and Y data, and then you give it the third dimension that you want to um, uh, histogram. You want to, so you want to bin the data uh, and give the and give the color or the Z uh, axis um, which property you want to do that. Which statistic am I using? You can do things like count, so you can make it add up. Uh, the third dimension, or you can make it do an average or a standard deviation. Uh, I tell it the ranges and um, so what, what area of the galaxy I want to cut the X and Y data in and the number of bins. So I'm using the same number of bins before. Very simply just setting up a new plot and using uh, imshow, which just takes a, a um, 2D, 2D array of values um, and produces the image of it adding color bars, so nothing uh, too extravagant, uh, which gives me these two plots. So in an X and Y range, you've got the average VR, this should have average marks on those apologies, but this is the average VR. So uh, in a square bin of so many kiloparsecs by so many kiloparsecs, what's the average VR value? And this is what we get at. And this is kind of what we would expect for a barred galaxy. You see this nice quadrupole butterfly kind of pattern in the center, uh, which is kind of indicative of the bar. You've got quite high tangential velocities quite near the center. And that, uh, sorry, low tangential velocities near the center and higher values out in the disk. Um, I have opened up a paper. This is by Bovi et al. I think it's 2019. It is, yeah. Life in the Fast Lane, it's called. This is from, um, this is Gaia and VVV data. And you can see the tangential velocities and the radial velocities here. You can start to see the same sort of pattern, low tangential velocities near the center and higher further out. There's beginnings of what is to be kind of a quadrupole pattern near the center, but observationally within the Milky Way, it's hard to get really deep uh, beyond the galactic center. The sun is over here at eight kiloparsecs roughly. Um, in this paper, they used another M-body model uh, from Colato 2017. And again, this kind of reproduces this, um, these patterns that we're seeing in the data. So this is a good sanity check to know that we're kind of doing the right thing. 
and also to not to plug my own work, but this is uh, something from my own paper uh, where we can see I am using a, a, a gas uh, simulation which has uh, which forms stars out of gas. It's not anybody, and you can attack. It, they have uh, stellar ages as well, so you can start to split by different age groups and see um, what their velocity patterns look like. And this is what uh, part of my paper is looking at, and you can see the nice butterfly pattern, the radial velocities is seen in the young stars and not the old stars. So just trying to bring it back into these kind of exercises is something we do uh, in research quite a lot. Can I, can I just make one quick comment about the, um, this is, it's mislabeled, it should be, the bottom row should be V5 or VR. I have missed a V5, you're right, sorry Victor. Just, just in case people, no, it's all right, just in case people <laughs> are confused. Yeah, sorry, that is VFI. That's me being a little bit lazy and know that I'm plotting the same thing twice, so I copied and pasted code, and I missed my color bar label to be VFI. Apologies about that. Uh, so looking into kind of, these are kind of line of sight velocities, but not necessarily from kind of um, a solar perspective. This is just um, along particular axes. So you've got, in a similar kind of way, we're looking at, uh, my figures have been too small there, haven't they? Let's see if I can try not to live code too much, but let's see if I can squeeze that down a little bit. There we go. So yeah. Oh, it's both the same axis anyway. That's great. Uh, no, it's not. This is, let's see, it shouldn't live code, but it's got to be done. There we go. We've got the XZ plane. And then the colors is by, and then we've got the yz plane. We're coloring by bx, so the the um, the perpendicular axes to the to the two that we're plotting here. And you can see um, for rotational systems, you get um, low line of sight uh, line of sight velocities uh, near the galactic center because you you're averaging from the near and the far side. And then as you move out, you're moving through. Uh, different uh, the the weighting from near to far changes, so you get um, these positive and negative values. Moving swiftly into kind of just very simple profiles, you can define um, a radius within kind of the xy plane by using uh, like the hypotenuse of the x positions and the y positions. You get a radius, and then instead of using two D uh, bin statistic, I'm just using the one D version of bin statistic. And we're, excuse me, sorry. <clears throat> we're binning in radius and we're binning the, the R and V phi values. But the statistic we're using is the standard deviation in each of these bins. And then we're uh, plotting just the, the bin and the standard deviation within each bin for both of these quantities. I don't know why the legend value has gone so tiny over there, um, but it has. Uh, but we can see just about that v r, uh, the sigma r, so the radial velocity dispersion is slightly larger or radiuses compared to the v phi. So this is all going out to quite extreme radiuses. We probably won't want to worry too much about here because out here there's so few particles that you can see the actual um, statistic is going a bit, um, bit noisy. Um, so we could probably chop that off uh, a bit further in. Um, so we're going to look very briefly at some more kind of orientations and um, transformations. Uh, so I've defined two other kind of matrix rotations in the X and Y. Um, I'm only using um, Z and X, but I just define the Y there because it's just easy. Um, I've got all three now. I can reorientate this disk kind of however I want. So we're going to do an orientation in the Z axis. Uh, to make the bar angle 45 degrees. And then we're going to incline the disc to 45 degrees as well. So these panels show that here. You've got the bar now is an XY now sitting 45 degrees off from the X axis. And we're also going to incline the disc. Uh, so when we look in the X uh, Z plane, we're not seeing a perfectly flat disc anymore. We're seeing an inclined disc. Now, why would we do this? Uh, well, the exercise we're looking for the pattern speed of the bar, so how fast it's rotating. And one of the methods of doing this is the Tremaine-Weinberg method. 
Um, and to do that, we need to know, we need to have the bar, the galaxy inclined and the bar inclined by a known value. So observationally, you'd have to kind of um, figure that out for yourself, try and fitting ellipses um, and such to be able to find those two values. But within simulations, we can, we can give it a known value and work from there. Um, this is a fairly bit of a uh, bit more complex code. I'm not going to go into the, too much of the details. One, because I didn't write all of this code. I'm going to shamefully say that I have uh, worked with one of our uh, other students who developed more of this code than I did. Um, but I've been through it and understand its fundamentals. I just didn't spend all the time uh, optimizing it myself. But Chiara, uh, a fellow PhD student, has been incredible in working on this uh, to make this code work quite nicely. So effectively, we're giving it a, let me show you this figure here. We've got the galaxy inclined and the bar inclined, and we're defining slits uh, along the bar. And we're measuring the average um, positions and velocities. Um, in this uh, kind of scenario where we're above the galaxy, uh, the VZ component is the line of sight velocity. So that's the component of velocity we're using uh, to do this measurement. And then following um, the paper that was mentioned in the, um, was mentioned in the exercise, wasn't it? Or do you think I might have lost the paper, the reference paper for this? I thought I did include it. Apologies, I, I'll find that link for you momentarily. Uh, but once you uh, look at these slits and find the, average positions and the velocities, and you plot those together, you form a nice straight line, and the gradient of this line gives you the pattern speed. So for this galaxy, we've got a value here of 143, 144-ish, plus or minus uh, five kilometers per second per kiloparsec. That comes from the gradients. And then from some level of fitting, uh, you can uh, estimate the uncertainty of these kind of measurements. And knowing the pattern speed is quite important uh, for studying kind of the bar dynamics. Uh, it tells you a lot about its, uh, its resonances and how it's interacting with the disk. Um, so I'm going to move through uh, quickly. So I'm going to start looking at kind of unsharp masking, uh, something that the observ observationists do uh, a fair bit of, and it can also help uh, the theorists as well. Uh, so I'm going to import a few more um, libraries, uh, as well as some more modules from libraries. I've already imported SciPy, but I'm use, importing a Gaussian filter. And for matplotlib, I'm using a, just a log norm uh, just to help with plotting. So we've got back to doing some normal um, XZ um, density maps and using statistic 2D. For the third axis, instead of using kind of velocity or anything like that, I'm just producing an array of one values for the length of the actual number of particles I've got, and then using the count statistic. So this is the sum um, of the data points in each in each 2D bin. Uh, so that's what we get. That's the same as before. I'm just a bit more zoomed in. Well, then what we're going to do is we're going to take this image and we're going to smooth it with a Gaussian filter uh, with a relatively high uh, sigma. So it's going to be quite smooth. And what you end up with this after you've smoothed it, which is just kind of the average uh, kind of density uh, in XZ space. And then we do uh, the original image divided by a smooth image, which leaves us with this, which is an unsharp mask. And what you can hopefully see is that the kind of um, the uh, kind of non axisymmetric features or the kind of the um, the kind of unsmooth features are pulled out a little bit more. They start to be a bit more defined. And what you'll hopefully notice in this image is that the X shape is not particularly symmetric about the plane, about Z equals uh, zero. And it's a little bit asymmetric. The top half is slightly larger than the bottom half. To kind of convince you of this, I've just done a very quick uh, difference map. So I've just taken the unsharp image minus the unsharp image flipped 
about the um, flips about one axis. So the, the, the y axis is flipped. And you can start to see there's differences from above and below the plane. Now, this is kind of what we expect for the kind of evolution that this bar went through. Um, I was going to find a GIF from my own research, but um, I found this as well. So hopefully my connection stays stable enough uh, for this to play. Uh, but this is um, an M-body model uh, from Rubens Macchiato. Um, very kindly lets me um, share these videos. Um, and what you'll see is this has got a very strong bar. This is slight, slightly in the XZ plane, but it's just slightly above it so we can see some of the disc as well. And it's got a very strong bar. And what's about to happen is the bar is about to buckle. And what you'll see, hopefully, is that as the bar starts to bend, let me see if we can get a nice orientation here. You see the bar, the bar is uh, buckled and bent, and you're starting to produce this X shape uh, feature. What you can see, hopefully, is that the, uh, the arms below the plane here are slightly larger than the ones above the plane. Uh, so this is the buckling instability within bars, and this is how uh, one of the mechanisms that um, galaxies can form these x shape kind of structures. And R1 went through um, this kind of buckling instability and formed this kind of asymmetry above and below the plane. Um, so as the kind of finishing touch of this exercise, this one we were looking at, uh, we're interested to see kind of what orientation angle uh, can you see the box peanut still. So I'm going to use the unsharp mask because that seems to be the, the um, best method of kind of detecting uh, the X shape and the, the, the clearest image of it. And I'm going to step through uh, different degrees of rotating the galaxy about the Z axis. and. For the majority, whoops, for the majority uh, of the rotations, we can still start to see it at 60 degrees. You're still starting to see some, but at about 70 degrees, we're starting to lose it. And then by 80 or 90 degrees, uh, with the bar seen end on, we're no longer seeing um, the X shape. So, Following on from this, we've done a lot of things. Apologies, that's my team's going off. Um, done a lot of uh, things from kind of uh, Cartesian coordinates, looking in X, Y, uh, Z space. Obviously, this isn't how we observe the Milky Way. Um, we're sat inside the Milky Way. Um, we can't manipulate it in this kind of way. Um, so we have to use, uh, we're stuck with kind of more of a, uh, with a, coordinate system um, from the observers, really. Um, our world is in, uh, we, we perceive kind of the universe out from our viewpoint um, in kind of angular coordinates and our angular perspective. That's how we particularly measure things uh, through telescopes. So when we're trying to do comparisons between our theory and uh, Milky Way observations, we kind of have to find some common ground so we can look at our simulations from kind of the, the solar perspective, we can approximate that. Um, you can do these coordinate transforms through kind of equations and following the mass through. It's probably a bit too convoluted and long-winded to, to go through um, in this kind of session, or if you're going to be speaking for uh, long enough as it is. So I'm just going to use uh, a package, um, just a sneaky little shortcut, uh, from Galpi, which includes some level of coordinates um, transformations. AstroPi has a similar kind of uh, set of functions and coordinates. Again, this is uh, from my work and my research. I've used Galpi for my work, uh, so it's just it was easier to, to follow similar lines of code. So we're going to try and approximate the Milky Way using the model that we have here. It's already been rescaled to kind of the, this, a similar parameters to the Milky Way. Um, in, in size and in velocity, I believe. Um, so we're going to um, just convert directly from uh, the VX, VY, and VZ into 
um, observational coordinates like uh, galactic coordinates. So for starters, we're going to take the just kind of the base model with the bar aligned along the x-axis. We're then going to do um, a rotation of the uh, bar to the approximate Milky Way uh, bar inclination angle, which is roughly about 27 degrees. And then this is um, this rotation, this matrix rotation goes uh, anti-clockwise. So it would put the bar down here. So all I've done um, to also flip the velocities in the direction of uh, angular momentum, I've just flipped the entire galaxy 180 degrees uh, face on the other way. So now the bar points up this way. I'm going to place the observer uh, at minus 8x over here so that when uh, we look at the center of the galaxy, so if the observer is at minus 8 here, when we look at the center of the galaxy, the near side of the bar or the bar that's closest to us is off um, at an angle that's, um, that's off to our left. So the bar points up with y. Um, so here's the XY projections from there. We're then going to do some coordinate transformations. So we're going to do the galactocentric XYZ to do a heliocentric XYZ, where we place the sun at minus 8, 8.2x. We're keeping the sun in the plane. It's kind of slightly out of the plane, but not by enough to worry about in this kind of uh, context. We're then going to do the uh, velocities as well. We're going to stay within the kind of galactic rest frame. We're not going to add some uh, velocity to the sun because the sun is obviously moving around the galactic center. So it has its own inherent velocities that we have to account for observationally. But we're going to stay in the galactic rest frame. And then we can convert these heliocentric XYZ into longitude, latitude, and distances from the solar perspective. Uh, so that's all that cells we're doing. Uh, the final step here is uh, the Galpi routines re uh, returns L um, from 0 to 360. So all I'm doing is just beyond 180, uh, moving everything back by 360. So we go to minus 80 to 180 as the full range, which is typically more common because this place is the sum at zero um, degrees longitude. Um, so here is all the data in LB space. And you can see 180 in either way. So we've got the galactic center, and then 180 minus 180 would be the galactic anti-center uh, pointing away from the galaxy. So we restrict ourselves to kind of just a smaller window. If we just look at, say, minus 15 to 15 degrees in L and B, we can start to see um, the beginnings of uh, an X-shape coming through. Um, this isn't the most clear spot. If I do a, an unsharp mask again, you can start to see an X-shape. But what you'll notice, instead of it being quite a nice, um, the, the arms of the X-shape, at least on one side of the galactic plane, being equal in their height, we've now got one uh, that sticks up a little bit higher um, on one galactic magnitude, not necessarily on the other. And this is uh, kind of what we were exploring earlier when we were changing the orientation of the disk. Uh, we were rotating by Z. We can see that the arms of the axis shape move in our view. And because we're now in kind of an angular coordinate system, the nearer arm is closer to us. So we actually see it for a larger range of latitude values than the other arm. Right. Thank you. I think you managed to mute him. Sorry, apologies. That wasn't me. Um, the other arm is further away from us because the bar is inclined at an angle. So it appears at lower heights uh, in this kind of angular space. So moving on to the final couple of things, um, we're going to look at something called the double red clump, um, which is the kind of a tracer signal of the X shape within the Milky Way. Um, if you can imagine, um, let's go to a uh, previous kind of side on orientation of the disk. If you imagine, um, say hypothetically, the bar was, uh, we are seeing the bar end on, and we're at minus 8x, and we draw a line through the X shape, 
what you'd expect uh, within the density kind of distribution is an over density here and over density here corresponding to each arm of the X shape. Obviously, from the bar isn't completely end on, it's at 27 degrees. So um, you don't exactly get one kind of a, a linear, linear distances. There'll be some level of projection, but you should still expect to find uh, two over densities uh, in, along the line of sight. And that's what we've done within the Milky Way, and that's what we can uh, do as an exercise in this, um, this model. So we're still in uh, LB space and distance space from the solar perspective. And all I've done here is I'm, I'm using pandas um, just to allow for, uh, for some storing of the arrays and allow me to kind of index the arrays a little nicely. It makes the syntax a little nicer. Um, and I'm using signal from SciPy uh, just to do some um, smoothing and some peak finding. And I'll show you why, because we're going to be looking for one degree fields in the center of the galaxy. And we're going to see if we can detect kind of two peaks in the density distribution. So kind of setting that up, I'm just I'm putting the LBD data into a, a pandas data frame just so I can index it a little nicer later on. I'm using um, 20 bins in longitude and 10 bins in latitude. And then I'm going to be looking within that same space, so zero to 20 degrees longitude and zero to 10 degrees latitude. And that gives me uh, one degree by one degree uh, pixels. I'm just creating an array to hold um, some values of the same size of the bins I've just mentioned. And I'm gonna iterate through each of these bins. It's not the prettiest, it's not the most optimized code you could possibly write for this, but I prefer this method because I can get in the middle of this process and for each, each one degree bin, I can I know exactly what's going on in that in that kind of space. So I uh, I cut out of the the full simulation uh, the L bins and then the uh, the L bin that I'm interested in at that current iteration, the B bin I'm interested in that iteration. I restrict myself to six to ten kiloparsecs, so I'm just looking at the very center of the galaxy. I don't particularly care about the near disk or the far disk. I'm just interested in the very center. I do a histogram of the densities along the line of sight. I then um, add a smoothing filter to it because some of them can be a little bit noisy and I don't want to find just low level uh, peaks. I want to define, I want to find the kind of the, the more general peaks that the X shape would produce. And then I look at the smooth, get the smooth uh, density distribution and find the peaks within it. And then I'm going to just plot out the density and the smooth density just so we can have a look in a moment and show it. And then if the number of peaks in the density distribution is equal to two, then set the statistic, uh, set the bin, uh, the LB bin that we're interested in to one. If it's not, then it's zero. So as we look through uh, a couple of these plots, I'm just gonna briefly show you a couple. We've got the longitude and latitude. I should have degree symbols there, but it's medium really. And the number of peaks. Uh, so you can see here, the blue lines is the is the raw data, and then the orange line is the smooth data. As we move through a couple of these, you can see that the density distribution gets uh, wider. It's starting to spread out, starting to appear bimodal. I may have over smoothed this a little bit. It's still finding one peak, but eventually you can see uh, the density distribution along uh, the distance, so along from the distance from the sun towards the center you see that it does become truly bimodal and there are two peaks and the peak finder detects them. So then when I um, plot this as a function of, oh my goodness, plot this as a function of uh, LB, not YZ. See, this is again me being a little lazy and recycling my code. This should be an LB space. You see the ones that have got the one value in here on the um, close to L equals zero. So very close to the galactic center and away uh, from the plane, because we don't expect to see the X shape at low down, we expect to see the arms at higher height. And then there's a couple of um, pixels out here which are behaving a little badly, but that's, that's not the X shape. That is just, if I um, scroll down to kind of the bottom here, we've got these profiles that have very few stars in along the line of sight. So we're quite away from the galactic center. 
uh, L values over here. Uh, so you get you get some of these values that have peaks, but they're just uh, just noise really. It's not it's not really a true peak in there. And some of these have two peaks that's triggering this uh, same algorithm. So it's a little bit quick and dirty, uh, but it kind of it, it is demonstratory and it shows you kind of what we're looking for uh, within the Milky Way. Uh, this has been um, observed. So you're looking at Gonzalez et al. 2015. Uh, the reason it's called double red clump is we're looking at um, a specific type of red clump, uh, a red giant star uh, that has kind of a fixed magnitude. And you can start to see that if we, this is at negative latitude. So uh, this is on low longitude away from the plane. If you go too low, you see the density distribution here has a single peak. And as you move out to about minus six, you start to get this double peak. It's exactly what we measure in the Milky Way. And it's also, again, to put my own work, something we measure in a different simulation. Uh, it's trying to approximate the Milky Way. And in the young stars, these blue lines here, you can see that as you move out to about five and six degrees latitude, you get these double peaks. So let me find my notebook again. Cool. So last couple of things, we've got another line of sight measurement from the um, solar perspective. Again, my axis labels are wrong. I'm so sorry if <laughs> I just try and figure out everything out, make sure the rest of the code works and neglect the labels sometimes. Uh, well, this is still VR, the average VR. So this is L and this is B. And we can also do it for average differences. See, I fixed this one, just not the one above. Incredible. Um, average difference distances. So within the plane, uh, as you move out away from the minor axis, and you've got you're looking at um, uh, more material further away and closer stuff um, away from the plane. And what you may also see slightly in this plot. Um, and potentially with the previous plot as well, is because of this kind of projection effect of the, the bar inclination angle, there is a slight left to right asymmetry uh, in this. It's slightly um, um, yeah, there'll, there'll be there'll be left to right asymmetries in this. Um, so the final kind of task. Um, I will hold my hands up and say I didn't complete myself because uh, unfortunately I didn't have a chance to kind of fully uh, digest it to be able to, to write something for you. But effectively, it's implementing the Tremaine Weinberg method from the solar perspective. And hopefully, if you did this, you'd come up with a similar um, value to uh, the one we measured um, earlier uh, from the kind of uh, XY, XY position uh, value. So no, I've gone through a fair chunk of that relatively quickly. Um, but hopefully that gave you a taste of um, how you can start to go through some of these uh, exercises and how some of them kind of relate to the research we're actually currently doing now. Um, but well, this is just my approach to it. There are many ways to approach the kind of similar problems and many ways to code the same uh, problem. So my, my approaches aren't gospel in the slightest, especially when it comes to axes labels. Uh, use the correct ones, I would suggest. Um, but besides that, I'm open to kind of any kind of questions of what I presented or if anyone wants to share any of their work um, how they've tackled the same problem or bugs that they've come across that they couldn't quite come across. Um, but that was all the exercises uh, from my end. So if anyone would like to <laughs> jump in or share or ask them. Thank you. Thank you very much, Stephen, for that excellent presentation. Uh, and showing us uh, all how to do those exercises. Uh, so I, I, I agree with uh, Stephen. Uh, if anyone would like to share their own um, 
way of doing these exercises or any other questions or comments, uh, please let me know uh, and I can unmute you or you can unmute yourself and speak up. While we wait for the audience, uh, Stephen, could we uh, for a moment go back to the point number 11 in your presentation? Yeah. I was just wondering if we can see the figure you were showing in a, I'm, I missed the left, to, no, not that one. Could you, could you scroll back where we see the left to right contrast? Uh, the plot of. Oh, this, sorry. Uh, no, I think it was in 11, a bit below. Oh. Uh, okay, no. Sorry, I'm not sure which part you're on. It's fine, I'll, I'll, I'll look it up. Oh, so you mean from the paper that I was showing? Yeah. Oh, sorry, this one? Yeah. Uh, okay, thank you very much. Uh, no, I think I have lost the plot uh, which I wanted to retrace, but uh, no worries. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. Sorry, I'm not sure. So would anyone like to uh, show how they have done the uh, this particular exercises? If not, uh, please join me in uh, thanking our speaker with a round of applause. Uh, the recording for this talk will be uh, made available as usual in the share the Google folder and uh, as uh, on YouTube as well. Um, and I'm going to stop the recording now. Um, I hope I see you all in the next session of Galactic Fidelity webinar series. And that's on this Wednesday, uh, where we will hear from uh, Dr. Preeti Cub about outflows from um, uh, Seaford galaxies. Thank you very much for attending.